Welcome to RHI Sociable City Interviews, where we meet with global thought leaders on nightlife and the social economy. Today, we are here with Matthew Dowse, President, International Association of Transportation Regulators. Hey, Matt, great to see you. Great to have you here. I, I've been an admirer of all your work over the years, and you certainly seem a tireless advocate for transportation. But maybe you could give a little bit of a background of how you got to do what you're doing and what it is that you're involved in. You seem to be involved in so many different things. We are. We have a lot of hats, and it's a, a great pleasure to continue to work with you for so many years, Jim, and the feeling's mutual. Um, so I, I've had a lot of experience in government. Uh, I left about 11 years ago, but I uh, was in city government in New York for 20 years, a lot of different roles. I was uh, an attorney for a, a lot of different agencies, human rights, community development, but most of my time was at the Taxi and Limousine Commission the regulator for TNCs, taxis, power transits, and commuter vans, as well as black cars and limos in New York City. It's the largest regulator and in, in, in the most complex uh, place in terms of regulating that type of service anywhere in the world, um, right up there with London. Um, and um, I was uh, counsel for the commission for uh, several years, and I became the commissioner chair or CEO of the, uh, of the entity. Um, and I left about 11 years ago. I have three hats I wear now. I'm still president, volunteer president of the IATR, the Regulators Association, which used to just be 34 years ago, taxi regulators. Now it's TNC regulators, departments of transportation, uh, police departments. It's a very diverse organization. Um, and we've had great partnership with RHI. Um, and we thank you, Jim, for serving on our advisory board and coming to so many conferences. I'm also an academic. Um, I teach courses to graduate students at a, a transportation center uh, up in Harlem at the City University of New York. I was a distinguished lecturer and now I'm transportation technology chair. Um, and last but not least, I'm a transportation lawyer, uh, labor lawyer, uh, corporate lawyer, but representing both governments, doing consulting, um, as well as um, you know representing mobility providers. Anything that moves basically is what we represent as my firm or anybody who does business with anything that moves. So it's kind of a broad category. It could be an insurance company, an automated vehicle company, um, a limo company, a taxi, a TNC, uh, or even a software technology company that's doing dispatches. So it's a kind of a varied practice. So we have our fingers in everything. So obviously my, um, my, my experience is unique. I have a lot of different hats and a lot of different perspectives. Um, I guess I'm kind of like an octopus with all those different eyes, you know, looking at different angles of things and seeing things sometimes that other people can't see. Well, you, you mentioned TNCs, just so that people who are not familiar with that term, it's transportation network companies. But also I've heard terms like eHail and uh, other types of terminology that applies to what would, we would put together as Uber and Lyft, which are the McDonald's and Burger King of, of transportation. But what's the most commonly used expression that people would relate to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, clearly Uber and Lyft have changed the dynamic. Um, you know, I'm not really sure who Arby's and Wendy's is in this picture, but certainly <laughs> Burger King and McDonald's is a good way to put it. Uh, they've kind of taken over everything. And, you know, they really, actually when they were very controversial when they first started right things have changed now they're really part of the establishment they have different leadership team but when this first happened it was craziness i mean there was violations of laws um people just operating um the ceo and the founder had a very different view of what the regs should be and, and rather than wait for them to be changed frankly if he didn't disrupt and violate the law i don't think we'd be where we are today you know, so I'm not one who condones that. The ITR was very much against it. We had a big fight and a throwdown with them at the beginning. But realistically, if they didn't do it, I don't think we'd be where we are right now in a lot of different ways. Um, they really changed everything. And then finally, they changed the laws at the state level to justify the business model. So even though they got it off to a rough start, they passed these state laws um, that allowed for software or transportation companies to operate as a provider or almost like a broker uh, with the drivers uh, at the state level uh, of regulation, which is a big change because for the most part, taxis had been regulated for a long time at the local level by cities. So they, I think that was a strategic move because they went over the heads of the local regulators and passed a law that applied for each state in the United States. Um, but they didn't necessarily do that in other parts of the world. Like in Europe, 
they worked with the taxi industry. I mean, there were some regulators that had different approaches and pushed back harder, but ultimately, um, you know, they went to the state uh, level and got these laws passed. And they are called TNCs, transportation network companies. There's a different type of regulation. They're not as closely or stringently regulated as taxis are. They, you know, they don't have to choose the color of their cars. The company can set their own fares. Um, and they actually do their own vetting. There are standards under the law for who can and who cannot drive in terms of background checks and so forth. But um, it's a regime of self-regulation, almost like the trucking uh, and bus industry under the FMCSA. You know, you have to get drug tested and, you know, just like the IRS, they're going to come in and audit you if the company is not doing what they're supposed to do, as opposed to taxi industry regulation where you can't do anything without going into the government agency, getting your license, they do the background checks. The, the, it's a self-regulatory regime. Um, and that's uh, and now there are other companies that are getting these licenses too, to compete with them. So they really changed the world in a lot of different ways. Certainly Uber and Lyft changed transportation in the United States. And um, you know now um, you know, we're going into completely different levels of disruption with automated vehicles, flying taxis and mobility as a service, which is really getting interesting by the day. I, I noticed uh, on, on your last uh, conference that, that I was on, um, there, there's also ways in which cities are looking to re, you know, reform their budgetary uh, obligations uh, by building in um, use of TNCs in a subsidized way to take away what the bigger overhead cost would be if they provided the bus transportation. Mm -hmm. You know, having a bus that operates uh, where you might only have, you know, four or five people using it, the, there's giving out vouchers during certain periods of time or like that last mile concept of uh, if you take your public transit, the transit company will provide you know, a voucher for you to get a TNC for that last mile. So it encourages more use of uh, public transit. Uh, so how, how do you see the, the integration of these TNCs to either augment or substitute for um, low volume public transit? I think, Jim, that's a, that's a good point. And when I talked about the impact Uber and Lyft had on um, the four hire sector, they also had an impact on public transit. Um, for, for decades and decades, public transit has been singularly focused in silos, build, you know, build more bus lines, create more lanes, add more buses, add light rail, add more trains. They never really experimented with the, these integrations with private modes like taxis or TNCs until recently. And in fact, you know, some of the organizations that represent these public transit agencies were resistant to this change until they started seeing that their ridership was dropping because they were losing business to the TNC. So Uber and Lyft actually created the scenario where the public transit agencies are now more open than ever to doing this, these first and last mile partnerships. And a lot of credit goes to um, the Federal Transit Administration, the FTA. Um, about six or six years ago or so, they created this thing called the Mobility on Demand Sandbox Program. It wasn't a lot of money, Jim. It was basically, you know, you know, 10, 20 million or something like that. And they gave out these competitive bids to experiment in the sandbox. Let's play in the sandbox with different new ideas for technology innovation. And one of them was let's, when you're in a two fare zone or when you're in a transportation desert, let's have a seamless integration between Uber, Lyft and Via or taxis for that last mile home. And, um, you know, we don't have the results of those pilot programs just yet. The, uh, you know, Federal Highways is supposed to be coming out with uh, an analysis as to whether they're working or not. But I think anecdotally, from what I've heard, these partnerships make sense. They work um, as long as they're subsidized and affordable. Um, they could be really the extension of public transit as part of an ecosystem. So I do believe it's part of the future and it's part of the whole concept of mobility as a service that we're seeing in other countries. Um, and that project really was the impetus for that. And we'll see what happens in a post-COVID world. Um, frankly, um, there's probably a way for the transit agencies to deliver better service by working with these companies and maybe even make money from these companies. I mean, there's a possibility that they might be able to franchise uh, spots uh, you know, at, at, in certain areas where you get off the subway and you have 
the, you know, the concept of maybe some EV charging stations on the sidewalk, um, a car service or a taxi or a TNC company having access to that those dedicated spots so that when people come out of a train at two in the morning, they're working the graveyard shift, that they can just hop in one of these vehicles and maybe swipe swipe their card or their or their smartphone. And I think that's the future. And some cities have been experimenting more than others. Unfortunately, many of the big transit agencies have not participated in it. Frankly, I think it's because there wasn't a lot of money involved. You know, mm -hmm. so a lot of the smaller transit agencies, North Carolina, uh, Arlington, um, a lot of a lot of these places are the ones that took advantage of those uh, pilot programs. But the true test will be whether you know Chicago and New York and LA and others make this a permanent part of their infrastructure. And I think they may because of the pandemic. I mean, the, the numbers are not coming back. And there's a lot of people out there that feel that this could be a permanent modal shift away from public transit. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to keep an eye on that because it's not coming back yet still. So yes. maybe we need these services to supplement public transit. Now, now during COVID, uh, some of the changes obviously were just a dramatic drop in ridership for not only taxis, but the TNCs. And restaurants obviously saw a drop in their patronage. And so it looked like the, the model uh, transformed itself to where you have Uber Eats and all the ways in which you can get takeout food. Some of them like Food, food Grub or whatever it was, they were kind of a pioneer in that sector of takeout delivery services. But then Uber saw the opportunities in that. And also with the scooters, as again, one of those last mile modes of transportation, the, the use of scooters, which, you know, Bird and those other kind of pioneers kind of dumped the scooters into cities, which created a lot of conflict. But then you started to see Uber and Lyft adding the, the scooters as a part of their mobility platform. So it seems that that business sector now has multiple divisions, particularly when you look at the take-home delivery services, not only for food, but now I've seen if you need to get your pharmacy delivered to your home, you can arrange for Uber or Lyft to go pick up your, your, your packages. So, so all of this seems to be creating a whole new dynamic, but in the meantime, a lot of this all depends upon those individuals who want to be drivers and use their own vehicles and cover their own costs in an environment where they don't have necessarily guaranteed income or the coverage as if they were employees. So I know in, in California, there was that legislation uh, because the courts ruled that um, Uber drivers are really employees. Uh, but as we move forward, you know, and I know that the availability of drivers is making the TNCs for, um, you know, passenger uh, service, they're losing the drivers to these other forms of more convenient transportation. Do you want to be out at one o'clock in the morning picking up intoxicated people from a bar? Or do you want to be picking up takeout food, you know, and delivering it to somebody's home? So the drivers themselves are more or less defining these um, divisional paths for these companies. How do you see it all panning out in a, in a post-COVID world? Well, you know, that's a good point, Jim. And it really has led to more congestion, I am sure. Um, you know, you have more different types of vehicles on the street now during the pandemic, delivering all, all sorts of food and packages more than ever before. You know, even with the rise of Amazon um, and, you know, entities like FedEx doing package delivery, Uber Eats was kind of ahead of its time. Now it's one of many companies that are putting, mixing and matching passenger transport with package and food delivery. I think that's here to stay, Jim. I think, um, you know, people have uh, like the convenience of it. Um, I don't know if, if the price point is there to make it a sustainable thing. Um, I think a lot of this work is subsidized. There was a company known as Halify that was at our conference that, that's doing the same thing on the taxi side. They're putting packages in between taxi trips. So I think the taxis never would have gone for that, in my opinion, unless there was a pandemic. You know, Uber, you know, these companies are more ahead of the curve and they kind of look at these different things like the taxi industry. 
would have resisted the package delivery unless they had a pandemic where basically there was no business mm -hmm. and why not try it? And I, but I think, you know, now that they're getting used to it, there's better ways to optimize it. And I think as a congestion mitigation measure, it's better to have these companies delivering it than adding more vehicles to the streets. And we also had like, you know, rickshaws uh, at our conference. Uh, we had this company, this entity known as Revolution Rickshaws. They've been doing this for a long time. You know, freight deliveries with, the, with bicycles and trikes. Mm -hmm. uh, and now there's, you know, it's not just four hire vehicles that are doing it. There's all sorts of contraptions on the street. I saw like a motorized bike that had like a trailer attached to it that Uber had. I mean, we're seeing really a, you know, uh, an explosion in, um, you know, in this area. And I think that is here to stay. Um, and now what that does for congestion um, and how it plays out in terms of economics um, will remains to be seen. I don't think they make a lot of money on, on these types of trips. Um, a lot of these, these drivers are taking it because they had no other income coming in. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in the long haul, the labor issue is going to determine and regulations are going to determine where these business models go. This progressive movement that's taking place in the country in certain cities and states like California and Massachusetts with AD5 and Prop 22, this is far from over. Um, cities like Seattle and New York have regulated mi minimum wages. Uh, Uber and Lyft are supportive of having a state law where the wages and, and the whole operating system for gig workers are worked into a paradigm where the independent contractors know what they're getting as gig workers, whether it's food or package delivery or passenger or passenger transportation. So I think the big question mark in this whole thing is really where we end up with the labor model. Um, you know, and I think we're going to see progressive legislatures also uh, putting a cap on, on fees that are being charged, which affects the business model. There are some cities that have, for food delivery, have said you can't charge more than X amount for a service fee. So I think it's all in flux right now, but as a concept, I think it will be there. What it looks like and who's been going to be doing it and, and how and how often will, is the big question mark, but I think it's here to stay. So 18 months from now, how do you think all this mobility will change how people socialize? Well, I, I actually think that these, um, you know, these curbside cafes are here to stay. I can tell you New York, I mean, some of them look nicer than others. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, we need to make sure that um, it, it's affected the way people get around. There's less parking spots, less places for layovers. We really need to hit the reset button on what we do with the curb and how we reimagine things, because I think there's a movement. Restaurants got all this, the one good thing that came out of this for the restaurants, they got all this extra square footage so, so they can, you know, they can make a little bit more money, you know, uh, hopefully on uh, times of peak capacity. Um, but I've seen um, the DOT in New York City in particular really went out of the way to, to do these things very, very quickly, almost like an emerge, on an emergency basis. There probably should be some standards in place and a, a thoughtful plan for using the curb. And because I think there was more of a concern to just let everybody put anything on the street. Now I think we need to walk it back and say, okay, it makes sense to have this here and maybe not have something there. I think it's hard to say no to an establishment, but I think that whole paradigm is gonna be, I'm sure, evolve over the next year, 18 months. You know, now that the, as the pandemic winds down, hopefully, or if we get these surges during the winter months when, you know, certain cities that have winters, <laughs> like New York and DC and others, um, you know, they, people are really not using those outdoor um, establishments. You know, it's just too darn cold. I mean, you can put as many heaters as you want in them, but uh, a lot of people prefer indoors. So as the pandemic winds down, I think they're here to stay. Um, but I think cities on the East Coast need to do more of what's been happening on the West Coast, which is more planning. Uh, how do you use the curb, congestion pricing? How do we manage Carmageddon? You know, there are people who opine, and I, I'm one of them, that public transit may never get back to where it used to be. Um, with the Omicron, uh, you know, uh, surge in the last few weeks, we've seen public transit workers calling in sick left and right. So the, there's less ridership, less service to begin with. And now you get a hit like this where, you know, you're canceling flights and you're canceling uh, public transit uh, routes because you have a staff shortage. These are realities that are going to persist. And there was such an increase in private motor vehicle um, usage and, and, and new vehicle registrations over the last year or so that people for a long time are going to uh, be, be taking private motor vehicles around. And, and the rush hour doesn't exist like it used to. 
in some cities. Like people aren't going in in the morning, they're working from home. Um, there's a lot of congestion that's popping up on the weekends now or during midday. Um, and for the nightlife economy, what this means and the scary thing that I'm concerned about is that from an equity standpoint, if people can't afford to take an Uber or a taxi um, to go out to clubs or public transit's not available, how are they gonna get there? You know, are they gonna carpool? Are they gonna have designated drivers? Um, are we gonna see, you know, I hope not a, an increase in DWIs. I think this is the scary part is that we're moving towards, uh, we're moving away toward, from car culture for many years. And now we're moving back to it in some cities and some states. Mm -hmm. um, and this causes not just problems for the environment and congestion mitigation, but it, it, leads to, it could lead to safety problems. So I, need, I think the curb needs to be managed moving forward. There needs to, every city should have a plan for maximizing the priorities of the curb, whether it's putting EVs and charging stations, reducing the amount of, of outdoor dining and have it make sense. Maybe there needs to be a certain type of structure there that's safe. I'm just, I'm waiting, unfortunately, for that day when there's gonna be a catastrophe and it's gonna happen. We all know that, Jim. And I'm fearful of that, that there's going to be a day when people are sitting there and a bus, a bus goes into, or a car goes into an, a, one of these establishments and there's not fortifications there or bollards to protect the people that are dining in the street. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunately just a matter of time before that happens. And the second it happens, as government usually does, they're gonna scramble and say, this is never gonna happen again. They really should be ahead of the curve now and trying to plan safety um, uh, features into these outdoor establishments so that the accidents don't happen. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, what happens in government is bad stuff happens and they say, okay, someone died and we're gonna, it's never gonna happen again. They oh, should be oh, looking oh, at this oh, now. Yeah, oh, and, right. and the same thing, same thing for nightlife too. They should have a nightlife plan um, and be managing this both at the daytime and nighttime. Well, this has been great, Matt. I really appreciate your insights. I think you've uh, you've painted the picture of of the future, and I, 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 I will we'll, we'll come back eighteen months from now and 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 review this little uh, segment and okay how close you were. It's but a day. <laughs> I thank you for your participation, and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thanks, Jim, and happy New Year to you and to everybody. Okay, bye bye.